Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and graves? They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. And those giants are dead now. Breaking down walls, moving mountains. How do you remember seeing God at work in your own life? I can tell you what I remember. Standing across from my wife on our wedding day. I remember holding her face in my hands and feeling like I was holding the very embodiment of God's grace and his goodness because of what he had done through this woman in my life already. I remember when my daughter was born and trying to comprehend how the miracle of life could be so tiny, but also how she was way bigger than I had ever expected and how it confirmed for me that my wife is in fact a superhero after all those hours in labor. And I remember when I sat in this room just a few months ago as you guys, my church, affirmed God's calling on my life to ministry and ordained me as a pastor. It was one of the most humbling and fulfilling nights of my entire life. Of course I remember those moments because they were beautiful and they were sacred and they were life-altering and personal to me. But not all of our memories are formed from the brightest moments, are they? Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak, we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. And now those altars in the wilderness, they tell the story of his faithfulness. I remember being scared. I remember being terrified of failure and weak in character as my ambitions were driven by ego, which made any success I did achieve shallow. I remember saying things that I would come to regret about the people that I cared the most about. And I remember letting people down and failing as a friend when people trusted me to be better. And I remember stumbling through a season of deep, debilitating depression. But I also remember that the story didn't end there. I remember that God heard me, that he was faithful even when I wasn't, that he didn't fail even when I did. And I remember how he loved me and saved me, which helped me remember this truth. This is our God. This is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, he beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Our memories, they have immense power in our lives. But I don't think you really needed me to tell you that. Because if you're anything like me, then you probably spend a lot of time and energy making sure that you remember stuff. And I got to be honest, 
If it wasn't for this thing right here, I'd probably get in a lot of trouble on that front. I spend more time every single day just looking at my calendar app to make sure I don't forget something or miss a deadline than I care to admit. But it's not always just my calendar that takes my attention or sparks a memory, because every couple days my phone decides it's going to put together a slideshow for me from pictures in my camera roll and alert me like, hey, I made this for you. You should check it out. I'm sure that's happened to you too. You know what I'm talking about. And I don't know about you, but when that happens, I always get this weird mix of feelings where like, I'm a little scared that my phone seems to know so much about me and it has so much autonomy. But I'm also like, man, I had forgotten about this. And now, thank you, AI overlords, because now my day is made. <laughs> and it happens to my wife a lot too. And every couple of weeks I'll get this text from her and she's like, why my phone got to do me like this with a crying emoji? And under it is a link that her phone made labeled this day a year ago that it's highlighting our daughter. And I always laugh at her, of course, but I'll admit that sometimes it's tough to acknowledge how big our daughter is getting. But most of the time, it's just a joy to think about all the things that she's learned since that picture was taken. It's a joy to think about the blessing that my marriage and getting to parent together has been. And it's a joy to think about how I've grown as a father and as a husband and as a pastor through that time as well. Ultimately, the person that I am, all of the things that are most important to me that define me are wrapped up in those memories. And if you think about it, you could probably say something similar as well. Because our past experiences, they shape the way that we see the world. They shape the way that we make decisions in the future, and they help define who we are as people. And that's why the word remember is a common refrain built into the song that we'll be covering this week, our last week, and our What Did I Just Sing series. This is Our God is a song that urges us to remember what Jesus has done, what defines who he is, so that his presence in our lives can define who we are. Because remembering it shouldn't just be a daily endeavor that helps keep our lives on track or a responsibility that we relegate to our phones. Remembering is integral to our spiritual lives because our relationships with God depend on it. And the ramifications of that relationship, they can be life-changing and world-altering. Despite the focus of this series where we've been singing, talking about the songs that we sing, the practice of remembering God's presence, it isn't always done through song. But that practice of remembering itself has been critically important when it comes to following God for a really long time. And when I say a long time, I mean we can look back to over 3,000 years ago and find it written in the pages of Scripture. The lyrics that we sing today, now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. They actually come from stories in the Old Testament, like in the book of Exodus. That's the book where we can read all about Moses' life and how God worked through him to deliver the Israelites from slavery. And once that part was done and God's people were free from Egypt, Moses now had a new family of roughly 600,000 men, women, and children, not to mention all their livestock that they brought with them. And they all had to survive in the desert, which we sometimes refer to as the wilderness. For years, they had to do that before they were able to make a permanent home for themselves. And in order to do that, they had to rely on God every step of the way to provide for them. That was true for their food and for their water, and it was true when it came to protection from their enemies. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men to go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that Moses' hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword, and Moses built an altar, calling it, The Lord is my banner. They won this battle, and Moses builds an altar to commemorate it, just like the song said. And they did that so that they could all remember what God had done in this singular moment. And they used it to signify that God is who they served. When we read the Lord is my banner, that's what that means. Kings and other leaders of the day, they all had banners of their own. And those banners were used to tell other people what belonged to their kingdom and the power they had to defend it. So when they say the Lord is our banner, Moses and the people he led, they're declaring that we're not going to be shy about following God and what God can do. Remembering that the Lord was his banner, it didn't only help Moses either. 
recognizing God in this way, it had ramifications that were far reaching because a different Israelite leader, a prophet named Samuel, he had to lead his people through a very similar situation. It takes place roughly 200 years after what we just read. And the Israelites are no longer in the wilderness. But that doesn't mean that they aren't facing danger. When the Philistines heard that the Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. Samuel cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. The Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines, and they threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin. He named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Hundreds of years separated these two stories. Moses and Samuel each faced a dire situation for their people, yet the same. And it's safe to bet that Samuel knew Moses' story well when he was doing this. And there's something that sticks out to me in that story that I think would have stuck out to Samuel too. It's this line here that says, Moses' hands remained steady until sunset. Because it wasn't really a steady hand that won them the battle that they were facing. It was their steady faith that God would come through for them in the process. And because Samuel knew that, when the enemy comes bearing down on him, his reaction is to cry out to the Lord on Israel's behalf. And when the battle is won, his altar is constructed with the phrase, thus far the Lord has helped us. And I don't think it's said like, thus far the Lord has helped us, but we'll see what happens in the future. I think what Samuel is saying is something more like, we've only come as far as we have because the Lord has helped us get here. Moses' altar telling of God's faithfulness informed Samuel, who built an altar of his own, because they both understood something that we have to as well. We need to remember God. This seems simple, but it's impossible to overstate how important it is that we recognize this regardless of where we are on our faith journeys. It's so important that large swaths of the Old Testament are devoted to it. It's not just Exodus or First and Second Samuel, which is where we were just reading. There are many more, more stories where altars are built to recognize God's presence. They were built so that every time God's people passed by them, they could be reminded of God's faithfulness. And saying much of the Old Testament is devoted to remembering God, it's a bit of an oversimplification and it doesn't paint the whole picture. But I say that because if you've ever opened your Bible, you may, like me, have experienced something where you open it and you're like, oh my gosh, I have no idea where to start or what any of this means. So I just want to tell you that I totally get that because trying to work through all the different books of the Old Testament, particularly if you aren't a fan of history, it can feel like a confusing, boring slog sometimes. But the importance of books like First and Second Kings and many of the books that are named after the prophets in there, the importance isn't just the history of the individuals or the kingdoms that are involved. Because whether a story involves an altar or not, these books were written to show God's people in future generations the damage that can be done when we forget what God can do. But more importantly, they're written to remind us of the beauty of what God can create if we remember so I want to ask you guys right now, where are the altars built in your life? They're probably not made of stone, but you probably have some. Where has God shown up for you? If you're not sure, or you need to be reminded, or you don't even know where to start when you're asked that question, I want to spend the next couple of minutes unpacking just a few ways that we can all do this better. And I want to start here. We need to remember God in the good times. This one may seem really simple to some of us because a lot of times when something goes our way, we're really quick to say something like, I'm blessed or God is good. And that tends to come particularly easy for us when it's involving something that we consider out of our hands. Like if you get a good report after a medical test that you're worried about, God is good. Or if you win the lottery, anybody in here? I don't know, anybody online? I don't know, let's talk later. Anyway, <laughs> God is good. Or if you find out you're pregnant, which... I guess it's isn't totally out of your hands, but you get what I mean. God is good. However, I do think that it's easier for us to forget about God moving if we're just in kind of a consistent season of peace and prosperity, like a little bit on cruise control. Obviously, even during a time like that, life is never all butterflies and rainbows. We're going to have some speed bumps some hiccups. But when things are just generally good and we're content and happy, it becomes really easy for us to get complacent 
in our spiritual lives. That's true for me. And it's not some malicious or evil thing. I think it's more of a subconscious idea that creeps in and it makes us think, well, I'm good right now. I don't have any needs or prayer requests. So God, you can just hang tight and I'll get back to you when I need something. When in reality, particularly when life is good, we should be trying to actively remember what God has done to get us to where we are, to that place, and thanking him for it. And then when we're ready, we can even take another step further and use this time of peace to strengthen our relationship with God rather than growing complacent. Another way that we often forget God or leave him out of a situation when something good happens is when we feel it's something that we have worked hard to earn for ourselves. Like when you graduate school or you get accepted into the school of your dreams to complete your degree, you probably worked your butt off and you spent many sleepless nights trying to keep those grades up. Or if you get promoted at work, it's probably because you've sacrificed a ton of time at home with the family, hoping to train and prove that you're worthy of this position. Or when you finally get to your wedding day, like I talked about earlier, you might be thinking, We're here because of how hard we've had to work to communicate well. And all those tough times we went through, we stuck it out and we made it. Or if you buy a new house, you were probably the lottery winner that we talked about earlier, if you're able to afford it right now. But really, you're probably able to afford it because you spent time learning and implementing healthy spending habits, which meant sacrificing a lot of what you wanted in the moment. And you know what? All of that is probably true. You probably did all that. And that is good because God wants us to grow smarter and more mature and he wants us to make an effort to be the best that we can be. He wants our relationships to prosper as people who care for each other. And the Bible affirms that if we're faithful with what God gives us, he just might bless us with more. The thing is though, in the midst of all of those blessings, in the midst of all of that, we forget that every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift is from above. That's true even if you've been working hard. It's true even if you haven't directly seen God working. He has been on the move to make blessings in your life come to fruition. And that's a good thing. Because here's another truth for you that might be a little harder to hear. No matter how hard you or I work, we will never deserve the blessings that God lavishly heaps upon us. And that's definitely true for me. At the top of the message, I mentioned how I was ordained a couple months ago. And if you don't know what that means, that's okay. It's not super important right now. All you need to know is that that particular ceremony is the culmination of many hours spent studying and answering questions. And then after you're done with that, you get grilled by a panel of people on theology and your personal life. And no question is off limits. So it's really stressful. And that doesn't even count the years that you've spent learning on the job while volunteering and serving at church or being on staff at the church. So when the time comes and it's all done, it's definitely one of those I did it moments. I made it through this. But even with that being true, I can think back over decades of my life and see how God has been moving to bring me to this point. And it's not as some sort of predestination or lack of free will on my part. It's more like As I have pursued God and what his will is for my life, he has opened doors and broken down barriers that I never could have on my own. In fact, even when I tried to go my own way, I eventually would come crawling back, having been beat down by the circumstances of my life that I created, and all I found was God's grace and a different open door. And if you're not sure what I mean, or you think that might be a little dramatic, I want to show you how. Starting with 20 years ago, when God placed a calling on my mom's heart to bring our family to PCC when I was just 10 years old. Three years later, God placed a calling on Beth Stoddard's heart, who you heard sing just a few minutes ago, to invite me to sing on the platform. And at that same time, Angie Frame was embracing me as a student in her ministry. 15 years ago, God placed it on Angie's heart to invite me to have a seat at the table as the leader of the student band. And 10 years ago, Because of the people that God has surrounded me with through the things I just talked about, when I encountered the darkest season of my life, I had support and direction when I needed it the most. Not to mention that I had spent years with people in my life pointing me to God and telling me that he was on the move every step of the way. And that means that the person that I am, everything I have in life, including all of my imperfections, 
have led to a deep-seated joy and hope and fulfillment regardless of my circumstances. And it's because of all those moments I just laid out on that timeline. My career, my friends, my family, my marriage, they all stand as altars that represent not anything that I've achieved, but simply God's goodness and his faithfulness in my life. Reminders of his power to save and his unending love. So if no one has had the opportunity yet, I just want to take a moment to tell you that God loves you. And if you're in a tough season right now, I don't know when the end will come, but God is moving for your good. If you're on a mountaintop and you're celebrating, look around you and recognize where God has been and think about what he has done to bring you to this place. So we need to remember God in the good times, and we also need to remember God in the bad times. In this series, we've talked about how God can breathe new life into you, how he has the power to transform you, and how you can trust in him even in the most difficult circumstances. So I don't want to rehash all of that because those are great messages that you should check out individually if you haven't gotten a chance to do that yet. However, I did want to give you some practical tools to help you remember how and when he does come through in those ways in the bad times. It's super important that we do this because when we are in the thick of our most difficult seasons, we have to have something tangible to cling to so that we can know without a doubt that God is faithful to deliver us. That even when we are scared and weak, he will hear our quietest, most desperate whisper and he will never fail. There are a lot of ways to do this, but I wanted to lay out just two to get you started. The first thing is something that I've seen work really well for some of my closest friends, and it's keeping a prayer journal. They not only keep lists of people they're praying for and write down their own requests, sometimes they even write out entire prayers that they're saying to God. But then weeks, months, and sometimes years later, when God answers those prayers, even if, if it's in a way that they didn't expect, they go back and they connect to those answers with the original request that they had written down. And that way, they literally have an example right in front of them, a paper-bound altar, if you will, of when God showed up. But maybe you're not somebody who writes in journals. That's okay. Some of y'all right now are thinking, there ain't no way you're going to catch me keeping a diary. And that's okay. Because the second way that you can remember God in the bad times is to use the people around you. If you have someone that you trust who has some spiritual influence in your life, ask them about it. Go to them and say something like, hey, you know me well. You know about my life. You know the good, the bad things that I've been through. Can you show me how God might be at work in this situation? Because I need to see it and I'm struggling right now. It doesn't just have to be questions either because you may know Elijah Shirelli. He's one of our other teaching pastors here. And he and I also have the privilege of being campus pastors at Powhatan together. But long before that was ever the case, we developed a deep personal friendship. And we used to talk all the time years ago about how amazing it would be to do ministry together as pastors, never really knowing when or if it would come or what it would look like. So now, as we get to experience all of the incredible things that God is doing at our church and in each other's lives together in the positions that we fill, we take the time to point it out. We'll regularly text each other and be like, can you believe how God is moving? This just happened. I can't believe it. It's crazy. And we'll reference big things or little things. It doesn't really matter. And this is especially true when one of us is struggling. We'll take the time to say, hey, man, I know you have a lot of anxiety about this situation, or I know that this conversation you had is weighing on you, but I can see God at work all around you right now in this way. And do you remember when he did this thing in a similar situation? Whatever it is, your conversations are gonna look different, but the point remains the same. We have to be active in how we recognize God at work, pursuing an opportunity to recognize God at work. Because not only will it give you hope when it seems like there isn't any to be found. But you'll also be able to see exactly what he's done so that when you're on the other side of the struggle and that day will come, you'll be able to attest to the people around you of God's presence in your life and how they can trust that he is with them too. And that's exactly what God wants us to do because here's the last thing. We need to remember God has a purpose for us. 
And that purpose can be hinted at and found in the bridge of the song, This Is Our God. It says this, Who pulled me out of that pit? He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but him. All of these right here are words of acknowledgement and remembrance. Lines like this are what our altars are built around. This first line right here, this is what God did for me. In my lowest moment, he pulled me out of that pit. This second line, when I didn't deserve it, he was moving for my good, pain for my sin. This third line, when I needed rescue, he was my savior. And I will remember that nobody but Jesus could do that. But this last line right here, who gets the glory and praise? This is a declaration of action. This has momentum and movement. Because God did all of these things, because my life has been changed forever, I will never stop giving glory and praise to him alone. Many of us are evidence of this change or will be evidence of this change. But we don't always remember where that change comes from. And if you haven't experienced that yet and are still exploring your questions about faith or you're in the middle of a struggle right now, I hope one day soon you will feel what it's like to be changed by Jesus. Because when it happens, he intends for us to help be the change in others. And the more that we all do that together, the better the world around us becomes. And we all need that, don't we? How often do you look around and think, this world needs to change? Like these people, maybe not these people over here because I'm one of them, like that's what we're thinking, but those people over there, they need Jesus. But the truth is, is that we all do need Jesus. But if we're standing in a position in our lives where we feel like we've found him and Jesus has changed us, but now we're just waiting for everyone else to eventually get it, then we need to remember God has a purpose for us. The Bible is clear. The life and ministry of Jesus is clear and how he led the people closest to him is clear. When we're lost, and when we need Jesus, he's chasing us down. He's seeking us out. He wants us to know that he is here for us. But once we're found, once we know Jesus, once we're in a place where we can remember all the things that he has done for us, we're supposed to be part of the solution. We're supposed to look back at the altars in our lives that signify when God came through and turn those memories into action so that other people can start building altars of their own for his glory and for his praise. And the best way that we can do that is by taking every part of our lives. That means the stories of God saving us, the times that he was rescuing us, the blessings that he is lavishing on our lives. Take all of that and point all of the glory for that back to him. And in that way, just like Moses, we can say the Lord is our banner. He's here for us and we are here for him. Just like Samuel, we can tell people, thus far the Lord has helped me. Every good and perfect thing I have, all the things you see, it's because of God's goodness. And guess what? He wants you to experience his presence too. You know, there's a lyric that we read earlier that may help us with this that we might not fully understand because we don't talk about it a lot. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh. The word Yahweh is the name by which the Hebrew people referred to God. And you may hear or read some other names that are used from time to time, but Yahweh, it stands above them all. What we sometimes struggle to grasp when we read this because of the language barrier is that ancient Hebrew, it was used differently than we use English today. Words weren't just descriptors or labels for things. They often meant much more. And names in particular, like Yahweh, carried a lot of weight. So when we sing the word Yahweh in this song, we aren't just referencing God or pointing at him. We are proclaiming all of the things that we believe that he is. The word Yahweh, it carries with it 
all of our memories of his presence in our lives and the very essence of God, if that's even possible in a single word. That means his eternal, omniscient, ever-present, all-powerful glory and the altars that we've built to him are wrapped up in the word Yahweh. In fact, the name of God carried so much weight among his followers that the Israelites eventually considered this word too sacred to say out loud. And that's because they understood what God had done for them and just how great he was. So let's do that too. Let's give all glory and praise to Yahweh. Let's not forget what he's done. Let's remember who he is and let's live our lives as declarative statements that shout his goodness to the world because we should always remember who our God is, King Jesus. Who gets all the glory and praise? Nobody but him. Who put me out of that pit? He did, he did.
This is our God, the one who loves us, saves us, and gets all of our glory and praise. If we'll remember him in the good times and the bad, then we'll be ready for the purpose that he has for each one of our lives. Thanks for being here today. We hope you'll come back next week as we kick off a brand new series. In fact, let's take a sneak peek right now. Enjoy, and I'll see you next Sunday. Tonight, breaking news as we come on the air. Well, the power of social media's influence. Today, it seems like everyone is in a battle for the most clicks. It is well known that human attention is drawn to novelty. She has more than 5 million Instagram followers and over 15 million subscribers on YouTube channels. And a growing podcast can be an excellent travel companion. Companies paid out $744 million to Instagram influencers last year alone. What is contained in this information? Is the source credible? Where is this information gathered from? Anybody can deliver news via social media. But now with social media, it's much harder to tell the difference. So where can people go? So how can we tell the difference? Is there any way?